Good morning. Um, I'm Diana Miller, an editor at Knopf, and it is my great pleasure to be introducing to you today Elliot Ackerman. You might be familiar with Elliot's previous novel, Dark at the Crossing, which was a finalist for last year's National Book Award, um, or his first novel, Green on Blue. And both of these books were acclaimed for um, Elliot's ability to get into the minds and hearts of people who we often think of as being inaccessible. And what he's done with his new novel, Waiting for Eden, is doubled down. Mm -hmm. What you learn on the first page is that the main character, Eden, um, is, is basically a shell of himself. He's confined to his hospital bed. He can't move. He can't speak. He can't communicate at all, even with the wife who's at his bedside. Um, and the novel is narrated by Eden's friend, who was killed in the explosion that injured him. Um, so I think you'll agree that's a pretty extraordinary premise for a novel. And it's incredibly powerful. Um, you'll see from the galleys you have on your tables there that it's quite short. Um, it's novella length. You could probably read it in an evening. I know we're all passionate readers. Um, but its size belies its strength. Um, and it has received a tremendous outpouring of enthusiasm in-house. Um, readers have been comparing it to The English Patient, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Um, some of the quotes we've been getting from our sales reps have called it an instant classic and a masterpiece. We're starting to get these responses from booksellers, and I hope you all will have similar responses. And what you'll see in a few minutes is that Elliot is also as impressive in person as he is on the page. Um, he is a working journalist. He was a White House fellow, a Marine, a CIA paramilitary officer. He served five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan and was decorated for his bravery there. Um, you know, on top of all of this, he's just an amazing fiction writer, and it is a huge pleasure to introduce him today. Um, well, first of all, thank you all so much, uh, Library Journal, for having me here today, and uh, thanks to my partner in crime, Diana, for uh, that introduction, um, which is sort of tough to beat. <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, it, it's really humbling. And again, thank you all so much for what you do for, for, for books uh, and, and getting them out there. Uh, and I thought today, you know, I'll talk a little bit about the book, but I'd like to talk a little bit uh, also about, um, well, I guess, libraries and, um, and what they've meant to me. And uh, I'll be honest with you, crafting these remarks proved to be a little bit of a challenge. So. Uh, you see, my relationship with books has always been a particularly possessive one. <laughs> so, um, like your brothers, I feel a uh, compunction to mark up my books, to dog ear the pages, um, to surround myself with them, to return to them, but not necessarily to return them to the library. <laughs> um, so I hope you all will forgive me, but I really wanted to be straight about this up front, um, because that and that alone made writing some remarks about libraries particularly difficult for me. Um, so aside from a few times in my life, I've often found myself avoiding libraries and sourcing my books in all sorts of different ways where I can be certain that I can squirrel them away without anybody asking too many questions. Um, so this did get me thinking about those few times in my life, though, when uh, I really needed a library. And coincidentally, they all had something in common. Uh, they were all moments of upheaval, and I think you could even say sort of moments of crises. Uh, so, like a prodigal son, you could say, you found me finding some refuge uh, in the library, and I, I guess I would even say that maybe library saved me. So, my earliest memory of seeking out a library uh, was when I was nine years old. Um, so, I was born in Los Angeles, uh, just to give you a sense of it, on a Saturday in April, perfectly blue sky day. Growing up, I was the quintessential SoCal boy, long, curly blonde hair, and a suntan. Um, so my prospects were always to live this sort of golden childhood on the Southern California coast, and that all got uh, changed. That all changed when my father got a job in London, and we moved to London in January. 
So London, <laughs> January, <laughs> just to give you a sense. Um, well, I missed my friends. I missed the sun. I wanted desperately to go home. And what was worse was that in our move, uh, all of our stuff got lost. So, uh, so I was sitting there with none of my things as a young boy. And um, another admission, uh, I have always been a little bit of a romantic. So at the time of that move, I was obsessively reading and rereading the boys' King Arthur. Um, it's a beautiful book. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, by the poet Sidney Lanier, these incredible in illustrations by the painter N.C. Wyeth. And uh, I really cherished that book, and it was in one of the boxes that got lost when we moved. So one afternoon, my mother, who understood how difficult this transition was proving to me, took me to our local library, and lo and behold, uh, you know, we found another copy of The Boy's King Arthur. So, you know, all of us are readers, and I think we intuitively understand how a book can transport you uh, anywhere that you necessarily want to, that you want to go. Um, but I think what is less intuitive, and at that age was less intuitive to me, was how books could not only take us to the places that we had never been, but that they could, and just as powerfully, take us to the places that we had already been, and to which we couldn't quite get back to. So at nine years old, I have very clear memories of those first few weeks moving to London, you know, coming home from school, lying on my bed and uh, rereading The Boy's King Arthur. And through that book, not only being back in the Middle Ages, um, but being back in my other life when I was in Los Angeles. And it was very meaningful for me during that transi transition to have that, uh, to have that book and to be able to sort of dream again of those Arthurian legends. So uh, having imbibed the legends of King Arthur, it might come as little surprise to you all that I found my way into the Marines. <laughs> God damn that book. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I spent, about, I spent about eight years in the Corps and did uh, several, several tours in the wars. And, um, you know, whenever I showed up at a new fire base, you know, in Iraq or in various parts of Afghanistan, um, you know, you'd always find a little library. Uh, and it'd be, you know, nothing much. It wasn't too much, usually we're f too far from where there was a radio watch, you know, one lone Marine or soldier sitting there monitoring radio traffic. And, uh, you know, it was nearby, so that person would have something to read. And, um, you know, if there were some guys from Texas in that unit, you would probably find some Larry McMurtry. Or um, a lot of people don't know this, the Marine Corps seems almost like half of it is populated with folks from South Boston. So you might find some like Andre Debuse, for instance. Um, and I think you'd be surprised that, uh, well, you know, being far from home for many, many months, you know, this actually is a pretty well-read group. Um, and aside from a selection of novels, you know, maybe some history or biography, there was only always one thing you could find, extremely carefully curated, meticulously cataloged in a way that, frankly, I think might even impress some of the people in this room. And that was gossip magazines. <laughs> so People, Us Weekly, The Star. I mean, we would spend hours <laughs> pouring over these glossies page by page by page wanting to keep up on what was going on and, and you might ask you know like why so you know we read these magazines and cared for them uh, because you know sitting there while you're watching a radio or you're waiting to go out on a mission by holding one of these magazines and flipping through them and you know, obsessing over their Kardashians or Britney Spears or who Clooney was dating. For a brief moment, we were back in America. Um, and I think we collected all of these magazines instinctively without even knowing it. And you would go to any place and you would always find them. Um, and that kind of act of curation was something that we did instinct, you know, instinctually. We didn't even know that we were doing it. We just knew that we had to. Um, so nearly 10 years after the war, uh, I was living abroad as a writer with my two small children. This is sort of the third time libraries come to the equation. Uh, and it was only a few years ago. 
And um, you know, this is actually when my marriage came apart. And you know, it had been a long time coming, but when it happened, it was you know it was messy, and we sort of crash landed back in the states. And you know, I was a single dad now, and you know, my kids are with me half of the time, and I needed to make a home for them. Uh, well, I was scrambling to do it, and I was doing my best, but to be honest, it wasn't quite perfect. So you know, lots of breakfast for dinners from dad, you know, maybe a few few too many peanut butter and jellies every day in the lunchbox. Um, and those first few weeks when we came back, again, it was just like I was nine years old because all of our stuff got lost from the moving company. <laughs> and my kids didn't have their toys, they didn't have their books, uh, and so I was basically seeing in them my nine-year-old self. So it wasn't long before I started taking them to the public library. And we found just about all of their old books there. You know, Mr. Tiger Goes Wild, The Day the Crayons Quit, all the Dr. Seuss you could possibly imagine. And, you know, for a while that was just about all we did together, was go to the library. And I would take them after school and we would sit on the carpet cross-legged, you know, probably making ourselves a little bit too comfortable, hanging out a little bit too long, but we would read. And we would read, and we would read, and we would read. And it was then, more than any other time, that I realized that yes, reading is a place that can transport you to someplace new. Um, but reading is also an activity that can take you home. So uh, again, I'm very grateful for all that you all uh, do to create those refuges, uh, those uh, refuges in our society. And um, you know, Diana talked a little bit about uh, the book Waiting for Eden um, and you know I, I, I'd rather just let you all you know if you if you open it read it but uh, you know it's really more than anything uh, a meditation on the idea of of grief um, you know yesterday I was just and I think it's something we all experienced I was at a funeral yesterday for a, a friend of mine who I grew up with for her for her father and um, and we were and just talking about that process of grieving and she was telling me you know I guess you know now it begins and it was this idea of grief being this transitory state that we move through until it subsides and we go on with our life. And sort of the question in, uh, in the novel is, what happens when it isn't a transitory state and we kind of get trapped in grief, which can also occur and which we don't speak about as enough. And as the title of the book suggests, I think that's when you just wind up waiting. So thank you all so much. And again, I'm honored to be here.